Thank you, everyone. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to talk about genetic biomarker panel for diagnosis of ne necrotic enteritis and coccidiosis in broilers. So this is really the first stage of what could be a, de you know, a, a biomarker development, um, but we are at the first stages of it. So for the pro-health package, um, <coughs> Nottingham um, heads up work package five, and work package five is involved in molecular biology. So we have the University of Nottingham, uh, where we've been looking at whole gene expression. INRA uh, in France, and they've been using high throughput PCR to look at immune gene expression. And the Veterinary Research Institute at Bono in the Czech Republic, and Ivan's going to talk about that later on. Um, so Ivan, Ivan has been looking at the, um, the, the genes involved in the microbiota, but I'll leave him to tell you about that. The work that I'm going to talk about then <coughs> is really a collaboration between University of Nottingham, Ghent University, um, Newcastle University, and also INRA in Tours. I'm sure a lot of you already know, but necrotic enteritis in broilers is caused by Clostridium perfringens. Um, <coughs> it's a gram positive anaerobe and it's ubiquitous in nature. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Necrotic enteritis is, is, uh, occurs when these bacteria produce um, alpha toxin and also this fairly novel net B toxin, necrotic enteritis B like toxin. So they produce these and then has a, a necrotic effect on the, on the intestine. Globally, it's estimated that the loss due to necrotic enteritis is about $2 billion, uh, US dollars. And this was estimated in 2016. The two diseases I'm going to talk about, necrotic enteritis and coccidiosis, though, it's possible that we're going to see a greater prevalence, um, not just in the UK, but in other countries as well in the future, because of the, reduced, um, the reduction in meta metaphylactic use of antibiotics and also antibiotic resistance. So these are diseases that you know, could be even more important in the future, although they're very highly um, important now. Okay, so why do chickens develop necrotic enteritis? It's actually quite, quite complex, and it's more than likely that we don't really fully understand why birds really develop necrotic enteritis. We know of some predisposing factors because of logic, because of experimental studies that have been done. So we know that Imeria infection, which causes coccidiosis, is a, is a predisposing factor. We know that diet can be a predisposing factor. So some, some studies have shown that um, High-protein fish meal, for instance, can predispose to necrotic enteritis. Um, a number of studies now have shown that there seems to be differences in the microbiota composition, which may allow then necrotic enteritis to develop, and also the immune status of the bird. So anything which immunosuppresses a bird, stresses a bird, could then cause the development of necrotic enteritis. So those ideas then <coughs> um, start, start with start with the, the idea that the Clostridium perfringens and the toxin-producing Clostridium perfringens are already present, and then some other factors kind of get together, and then, then we get the development, we get maybe the um, reproduction or change of status of the bacteria, which then causes the production of um, the, the toxins that I mentioned and destruction of the intestine. There's been some studies that have suggested that um, in healthy animals, the net B producing um, toxin bacteria and also the alpha producing toxin bacteria generally aren't present. So there may be something else going on there as well. So as I said, it's not a, it's, it, we have some ideas about why a bird has, um, why a bird has necrotic enteritis, but there's a, a lot of work probably still to be done on that yet. Imeria, though, is a, a known predisposing factor, and there's a number of species of strange, strains which can um, infect chickens. Um, these, not always, but quite a few of them colonize different regions of the intestine, and more often than not, that's really how birds are diagnosed. They're diagnosed through sort of pathological lesions in different areas. So coccidiosis itself is a very important disease, um, we have fecal oral transmission of Imeria species. 
Um, so when we have you know, high intensity production, then you can see how that could easily kind of transmit all the way through the house. Highly infectious. Um, we see reduced feed intake and feed conversion. And ultimately, we see very significant economic loss. So both of these diseases cause billions of dollars worth of economic loss worldwide. Okay, so the infection study um, at Ghent University, they used Ross 308 broilers. So these are fast-growing broilers. And these were inoculated on day 18, 19, and 20 with 5 times 10 to the 8 colony forming units per mil of Clostridium perfringens, strain 56. And strain 56 is both alpha toxin positive and net B toxin positive. And it has been shown in uh, quite a few studies now to cause necrotic enteritis. The birds were then euthanized on day 21, and the tissues were immediately preserved in RNA later according to a, a, a uh, standard operating procedure which we developed in Nottingham, which we sent out to all the partners who were going to who were going to um, preserve tissues for us, intestinal tissues for us, to make sure that everybody preserved the same uh, tissues from the same area of birds um, and pigs as well, as we also looked at pigs. <clears throat> So initially then, Ghent sent the tissue to INRA, um, preserved tissue to INRA. INRA then processed the RNA, tested it all for purity and concentration, everything else. And they looked at 24 positive birds with necrotic enteritis and 15 negatives. And they then ran high throughput PCR to look at 90 immune genes to see where the differences were with um, birds which had necrotic enteritis and, and those which didn't. I'm not going to talk about that though. <coughs> So then INRA then sent samples to us, the RNA samples to us, and we processed them for whole genomic microarray analysis. And we, in the whole genomic microarrays, we looked at uh, six positive and four negative. Some of you may, um, may not know how the microarray works, works, but essentially we buy in printed um, arrays where we have oligonucleotides of, of 44,000 um, genes within the, the chicken genome, which is virtually all of them. We then take our genomic DNA from the samples of birds that we've got, and we, we put a fluorescent label onto that, and then we see where we anneal. And essentially what happens is, the more um, product that we have there, the greater annealing we get, and then therefore at the end of it, the greater the fluorescent signal we get. That's essentially how it works. <coughs> <coughs> so this is the array that we used. Um, this is a, a microscope slide, essentially, with four arrays printed on it, and each of those four contains 44,000 genes. So, you know, we're doing four times 44,000 genes on a kind of a, a microscope slide. The array that we um, used... Um, is quite well published, um, so there wasn't any problems with that one. And it's a, a six sigma um, oligonucleotide um, array. So we have um, 60 nucleotide read, read lengths. We then process it on this system here, this, this TCAN HIB, HIB station. And what this means is that it's fully automated so that we don't have to touch anything. So essentially, um, the whole system is fully automated, which means that we get good sample control, but it also means that we're handling it less, so it's not as if we're introducing all sorts of different problems that we, that we could do during the process. And that's the result. Lots of green dots, essentially. So on the left, we have necrotic enteritis, and on the, the right, we have negative control. So essentially, then, we've got, you know, all of these green dots, and what we're looking at is does one gene flash green if it's a positive control for it, a positive um, infection, necrotic enteritis, for instance, and it doesn't fl flash green for a negative, or for the birds with necrotic enteritis, does it flash green, but it's higher or lower than the negative? So that's kind of what, what, what we're going to test. So 
So making sense of the dots. So we use this um, platform called GeneSpring. So we've got our sample that essentially looks like this. We put it through GeneSpring, and we come up with things like this volcano plot. So the volcano plot can then um, compare the green dots, how green they are, and if they're there relative to one sample or the other. And then from that, we get, we get a full differential change in gene expression, um, which can be down-regulation, negative, or up-regulation, positive. <clears throat> from that, we then um, use this principal component analysis, PCA, to look at variation within the group. Um, Essentially, how it works is it's, it's quite complicated mathematically, but essentially what it does is it looks at the whole variation within a group of samples, so within your negative controls, within your birds with necrotic enteritis, and then it also looks at the differences between them. So it's variation from one group to the other, and then variation within a group. And essentially, the further apart they are, so we look at variation between groups, the further apart they are, then the more variation we've got. If we look at within a group, um, the closer they are, the less variation we've got. So that would kind of be better. So you want more variation between the groups and fairly close variation within. <clears throat> so when we did that then, we had the total number of genes which were differentially expressed were 2,095. So what that means is that when birds had necrotic enteritis, they had 2,095 genes which were differentially expressed compared with the, the healthy controls. And you can see here that we have, we also measured genes which were express, expressed more than twofold and genes which were expressed more than fivefold. Generally, genes which are expressed more than twofold, if we look at the probability of 0.05, they're significant. <clears throat> so all of these were significant genes. In total, we had 193 gene ontology pathways affected by necrotic enteritis. So the, the multiple interactions with these different genes to form a pathway, there was 193 separate of those. And here's some examples of them. So you can see here we've got things like neutrophil chemotaxis, neutrophil migration, uh, leukocyte migration, leukocyte chemotaxis, these are all sort of pathways which, which were affected. Largely, um, a lot of these pathways, which we haven't really focused on so much, these immune pathways, um, because INRA did that with their PCR, largely they came out the same. So they found differences with their immune response as well, which you might expect, obviously. Um, <clears throat> we didn't go further with any immune genes, though, because we thought <clears throat> with some of the some of the immune genes, it's kind of difficult to get a real sort of print on what a disease like necrotic enteritis would look like compared with other diseases, because we have lots of different, you know, um, interleukins, chemokines, things like this, which would be producing all sorts of different diseases. So it's kind of hard to get an actual print, blueprint, of this would look like necrotic enteritis. So we've, we've tended, and not to tended to, uh, to look at the, the other genes. Okay, so if we've got 2,000 genes then, and we've got 193 pathways affected, how do we get from, because we can't have a, a working platform where, we've got, where we're looking at 2,000 genes, so we need to take this down to a more workable platform where we can just use something like PCR. So, first thing we did then was multiple test corrections um, using Bonferroni analysis. And when you look at, when you do a multiple test correction, um, so first off, you know, as scientists, we normally, we would normally say, as biological scientists, we would normally say that a p-value um, at 0.05 would be, would set significance. But when we do gene analysis, we could be looking at thousands and thousands of genes. So essentially what, what these multiple test corrections do is, they give the overall effect to be greater than or less than 0.05. So what it means is that we start off with a larger number of genes, but when we do multiple test corrections, such as Bonferroni, it cuts down that number massively. <clears throat> but what it should mean is that the genes that you're left with are the most robust of all, because they're 
you know, they're way out there. They're very significant. That's, that's the idea of it. But we also looked at sensible genes. <clears throat> so we looked at the genes where we had multiple test corrections and they were still present. And then we said, okay, well, which of these then, in the context of necrotic enteritis, could be sensible genes to, to look at? So we could cut it down further and choose a panel which we thought would be most appropriate. And from this, we come to 11 genes, which we'll just refer to as A to K. Um, and these were analyzed in further 10 chickens with necrotic enteritis and controls. But this time we use qPCR. So whenever we do any of this gene work, the microarray, for instance, or even if we do deep sequencing, that's great for giving us the overall picture because we couldn't possibly do all of, you know, we couldn't possibly PCR 44,000 genes. So the, the genomic analysis at the beginning gives us the big picture and then we find a way to sort of crunch down to a smaller one, use PCR because the PCR is the, really the gold standard. So 11 genes which came up, which we thought sensibly came up through bomb parole analysis from what the genes actually do from our original big study we then said, okay, well, we'll look at these, but we'll look at them by PCR now. And that would validate the microarray. And it also means, of course, we've got a smaller platform. So in future, we can look at thousands of chickens, you know. So what we then did was we um, looked at the, so we looked at these, these were Ross 308 with necrotic enteritis, and we looked at these by quantitative PCR. And if you're not aware of it, the quantitative PCR works a little bit like um, you know, the idea of the fluorescent signal being more or less, and it's a way that we can kind of quantify. Because when we used to use conventional PCR in the past, we'd have to run out products on a gel, <clears throat> and that would tell us it's there or not, but it doesn't really tell us anything about it's higher than lane, you know, lane one's higher than lane two, or it's different than lane three or whatever, but with quantitative PCR, it does. So this is really a sort of blue standard. Okay, so when we looked at our um, genes then, birds with necrotic enteritis, and we've got genes A to K, it looked like this. So we had six of the 11 genes were downregulated, significantly downregulated, and two of the 11 genes were significantly upregulated. So eight of our 11 genes then were that we got from the microarray, we validated by qPCR. But we got a very, you know, I wouldn't say unusual, but a, you know, quite a sort of specific sort of pattern here where we got a lot of downregulation of these genes. And when we picked out the genes that we picked out, we kind of expected that to happen. Then what we did was we took Ross 308 and at Newcastle. Um, these were infected with 2,500 oocysts of Imeria maxima. And when we look at these on day six post-infection, we took our, our biomarker panel of genes, qPCR, and said, okay, so what, is it, what, is it, what does this profile now look like when we qPCR these? Because these got coccidiosis, not necrotic enteritis. And what we found here was, if you looked at ROS 308, which are the same as we use with the necrotic enteritis, so these are the fast-growing broilers, and we looked at Ranger Classic, which are slow, slower-growing bro broilers. What we found was that with the ROS 308, the genes which were all down-regulated with necrotic enteritis, quite a few of them were up-regulated when they had Imeria maxima infection and coccidiosis. Ranger Classic was a little bit different because um, what we found was there was only one of these genes differentially expressed at this concentration, at this day post-infection. So with ROS 308, so remember these are the same birds that we used with the, um, that, that we had necrotic enteritis in, that same genotype of chicken, I mean, not the same birds. Nine of the 11 were upregulated, whereas most of these were downregulated when they had necrotic enteritis. So we've got a completely different expression profile in the two diseases. With the Ranger Classic, we had one of the 11 upregulated at the same time point, same number of oocysts, and so therefore the Ranger Classic then, the, 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 the genetic response to disease was very, very different to the ROS 308. We looked at 7,000 oocysts, day six. 
basically we've got um, with 308 and Ranger Classic, two of them upregulated. And then we look at 2,500 USIS, 7,000 USIS with day 13. Day 13, no differential expression. Uh, with 2,500 USIS. When we got 7,000 USIS at day 13, we're starting to get a little bit of recovery. So in the Ross 308, we're starting to see some of these genes upregulated again. So then essentially then, Ross 308 with necrotic enteritis, we have these genes A, B, A, B, C, D, F, and H all downregulated, but A, B, C, um, F, and H are all upregulated when these birds had imuria infections and coccidiosis, using 2,500 USIS at day six. We get with uh, Ross 308 ne necrotic enteritis, two of the genes that were upregulated were also upregulated with the imuria maxima infection. 2,500 uses day six. But the Ranger Classic were very different, and we got upregulation of one of these genes. So we had one gene that was upregulated in all samples. So, in summary, we've isolated a panel of five genes at this point, which may differentiate necrotic enteritis um, from coccidiosis, at least in ROS 308. We've got to do a lot more work with the Ranger Classic and probably look at some other genes as well. We had eight genes upregulated in fast-growing ROS 308, but not differentially expressed in the slow-growing Ranger Classic. So there's obviously a very there's a the difference there between the fast-growing and slow-growing uh, broiler, how they respond to disease. But we've got a lot of work to do yet because what I did say was this was kind of a starting point. It's got us to a point you know, where we've took this 44,000 massive genome and got it down to a, a, a number of genes that we can work with that look you know, good potential candidates, and then we need, we need to move on from there. So we, we need to ask questions such as, what are the earliest points at which we see these genes change in C. perfringens and E. maxima infection? Do we see the same profile earlier with 7,000 E. maxima usis? So if we, if we had 7,000 E maxima usis and we looked at it on day two, for instance, would it look something like day six with 2,500 usis? We don't know that. But if it does, then we could be possibly looking at really early di diagnosis. Um, do we see the same profile with other species or strains of Imeria? So is this, you know, is this really just Imeria maxima or do we see it with, with others as well, Tonella? is servilina, et cetera. What is the expression profile of the biomarker when we have a mixed infection of Clostridium and Imeria? Because in the real world, that's quite often what we see. So we quite often see, remember, because I did see originally about it being a coccidia being a, a predisposing factor to necrotic enteritis, so we can see this co-infection. So what do we see then? And we need to do a bit more exploring the difference between the fast and slow growing broilers because there's obviously a difference there. There's a different genetic response to disease. So thank you for listening. Um, this is the group in Nottingham. Um, my email address is there, so anyone can contact me if you want any more information or any questions or whatever. Thank you very much. <laughs>